celebrating our 20th season. From the College by the Lake, meeting the personalities and discussing the issues that affect all of Coeur d'Alene and the Inland Northwest, we are the North Idaho College Public Forum. And now, here's your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Today we have as our subject, constituency service in a United States Senator's District Office. And we're very fortunate and pleased to have on our program Sandy Patano, who is the District Administrative Assistant or Field Representative for Idaho United States Senator Larry Craig here in North Idaho in the five northern counties. Our guest uh, was born and grew up in Spokane, Washington and was educated in the school system of Spokane. She has been with Senator Craig for 10 years. Uh, Senator Craig was first elected to the United States House of Representatives in 1980 where he served for 10 years and in 1990 uh, was elected to the United States Senate replacing the senior senator of our state, James McClure. Uh, senator Craig serves on uh, some very important committees for the state of Idaho, first the Agricultural Committee and second the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. He is also the ranking member on the subcommittee of Mineral Resources Development and Production. Uh, he, in addition to that, serves on the Special Committee on Aging. And so Sandy Patano works in relation to all his duties and responsibilities. And of course, a lot of that comes up in her district office. Uh, Sandy, it's a pleasure having you on our program and welcome on behalf of Janelle and our staff. Thank you. It's very nice to be here today. Thank you. And I'm always pleased to have our regular panelist, Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho. And I shall ask Janelle to commence today's questioning. This program is going to be a service to the people who are watching. So in order to help them understand a little bit more about our program, what exactly are the district offices in a, the senator's district offices, or in some cases, representatives' district offices? The district offices were first set up, I think, to increase the accessibility of people living out in not only rural areas, but other communities within a state or within a designated congressional district and it was to afford them a place to go to air their opinions and points of view, share their concerns, their criticisms with the senator or a congressman, and occasionally just go there for help if they um, were involved in the maze of bureaucracy and, and weren't getting the assistance that they needed. They often will come to us as maybe even a last resort for some assistance in trying to contact the appropriate people, but mo more than anything, I think it's a way of, they're, they're throughout every state, to make their offices and, and themselves more accessible to the people that they represent. Let's use Idaho as an example. Where are the Idaho district offices for Senator Craig, for example? Senator Craig has off six offices set up in the state of Idaho. Um, they are Coeur d'Alene, for the north, Lewiston for mostly central Idaho, a Boise office, Twin Falls, Pocatello, and Idaho Falls. What can, what can a person expect in the way of staffing in a district office? Uh, will there be people there to help them? Uh, will there be more than one? Uh, are the offices located where it's easy to get to them? What, what are the answers to some of those kinds of questions? Traditionally, the offices were set up where the majority of staff was in Washington, D.C because that's where all the legislative action was, and that's where the senator was much of the time, or, or a representative, and so initially that's where people have had most of their staff. It was Senator Craig's, I think, idea to bring and balance out part of that staff and putting them out in the district or state as well. So in most of our offices you will now find at least two people, and what you can expect usually is someone to greet you, um, occasionally we may not be there, we may be working in another outlying area where we often set up offices for two or three areas, just again trying to increase that accessibility. But there to help take your comments if you come in and again are concerned about a, a particular issue or piece of legislation or are having problems or difficulties, we're there primarily to offer assistance. The people are trained and um, I think very professional and very dedicated and willing to help. Well, there are many more questions I could ask you, but I'm going to go to Tony now and let him ask, and then I'll get another chance. Uh, Sandy, I think you articulated so well <clears throat> the fact that if all the staff is in Washington, D.C., and the congressman or senator, in this case the senator, must spend an awful lot of time there if they're going to be effective if they serve on so many committees. And 
In the, in the case of Senator Craig, we have shown that only some of the major committees, he also serves on subcommittees, and there's a lot of voting to do and, and meeting uh, not only government leaders from the executive department, but foreign countries. So I'm just trying to set a stage to say there's just no way when you're as far away as we are in Idaho for the senator to be home a lot, although I, I find it remarkable they can come as often as they do on those uh, red eyes uh, on the weekends. But based on that, it really justifies having people back home because there's so many individuals with, that have problems. So my first question based on that, that preface is that uh, <clears throat> have you found that uh, with a lot of the constituents, the fact that they can get in touch with you on a daily basis without calling Washington, D.C., that that creates a, a different attitude toward uh, our legislators in the Congress because that you are here to be uh, that liaison or, or oftentimes the ombudsman for those individuals? Well, I think it, it's an attitude at least that people know they can be heard. And that's one thing people do ask, you know, is if I give you these comments, do they go to the senator? And while they're talking to us, either be on the phone or in person, we're usually taking notes and writing up as accurately as we can what they've said so that their comments do go directly to the senator um, as they have said them. I think that today, just as you've said, it's difficult to for the senator to be here all the time just because of the roles and the demands that we've placed on them and especially in the Senate where you have so many different committee assignments. One of the things I think though is beneficial is that we are often perceived we're the, we're the closest thing to the senator and so our actions and the things we do for some people and especially in large states that's all many people will ever see of their representatives. So it's critical that you share a similar philosophy and that you also give them the very best service you can because your actions will be perceived to be their actions, their representative. Um, I think uh, it's, it's always been a challenge. There's always new things. People come in with a variety of um, different problems or questions or concerns, different viewpoints, and to me it's always been a learning process. You brought to my mind uh, a this conversation I had one time with Senator Howard Baker, who was the majority leader of the Senate at one time from Tennessee. And before him, his father was in the House from eastern Tennessee. And he said he, he could recall growing up that his father was there for like three months and was home during the summer and the fall and could meet the, the citizens. And now with the complexity we live in, it's from January almost to December. I know a lot of times they take August off. So your role is more vital than it was when uh, they got to be home. Uh, it's, it's a year-round uh, responsibility for them. And, and based yes. on that, uh, don't you also expedite the whole process? I mean, in, in, again, modern technology. If, if I came in and I had a real serious problem with some agency in the federal government, and they do move slowly, and they're very large and cumbersome and a lot of employees, uh, you don't even have to wait anymore, do you, Sandy, for the mail service? Now, don't you use a lot of technology like faxing and, and getting attention to matters much more rapidly than even when you first started in the business? Oh, the, the changes in technology and improvements, they are exciting. And I, I know you see it here at the college. Janelle, you, Janelle, you see it in your business. Uh, when I initially started, I can remember a fax machine that you had to put a phone receiver in. And it usually took which I thought was speedy, 10 <laughs> minutes. But today it takes one to two minutes. And the fax machine really is part of the lifeblood of an office and also in the communication with like your office as well as the bureaucracy or, or different federal agencies. It's um, something that can be immediate and happen now versus sending it via the mail or sending it, you know, over a, or or just other technology the way that it used to be. Computers have played a vital role in our office. We now communicate with staff where we don't have to utilize the phone all the time and can send a message or request for legislative information. And even when a constituent comes in and wants to know the particular status of a piece of legislation in either the Senate or the House, we can usually dial a phone number, pull it up on our screen, give them the status, 
of what that legislation is, who the co-sponsors are, and any other information that they might need. And that's very quick action. One more piece of technology, and I'll go back to Janelle. You've used this already at North Carolina College. We have some new facilities here that, uh, that are quite exciting about assisting everyone in the community. With this new technology where we have what we call uplink and downlink and satellite connection with our new facilities here, uh, I believe you've used that already once at Senator Craig when he's trying to get home and can't because of actions in the Congress. Would you tell us how he uh, is in touch with his constituents uh, through this new modern technology? Oh, I'd love to. And I'll just give you the example of our using the services of the college last fall. At the last minute, Senator Craig was detained in Washington, and it was at the time of the Clarence, Clarence Thomas hearings. And they had scheduled a vote for that evening, and because the Senate is the, the body that confirms the nominees, he had to remain back there. But a meeting had been scheduled, and we had promised people that he would be here, and at the last minute contacted the college and said, I'm familiar with your new state-of-the-art communications program, telecommunications program you have at the new library facility. Can you help us and help Senator Craig? And it was a congressional, uh, what we call regional advisory committee, people throughout the region, the 10 northern counties that come together, tell him what they're hearing out here and um, in their communities what's happening and then also to find out what's going on in Washington. In any case, the staff did a terrific job. To my knowledge, they'd not used the facility yet, uh, only for some trial runs, and they quickly, in a two-day or a, a day period, put this together. All of us, um, after having dinner here on the campus, went over to the center, and they each were able to sit at their own stations and communicate directly with Senator Craig from his home at 10 o'clock at night. It was 10 his time, seven hours in Pacific, and they were able to carry on a dialogue, not where you really have to pause and go back and forth. It was a very continuous dialogue. And there's that visible contact. Yes, yeah. and the audio cap or yeah. the visual capabilities yeah. are there as well. It's very exciting, and I think we're fortunate in North Idaho and throughout the state now just to have this new technology available to but us. But having a staff on location here, then you make all of that more possible along with the, yes. the new art uh, that we have in, in, in the field of technology. Janelle? I want to ask you some questions <clears throat> about what kinds of things people can come to your offices for. I take it that one major area would be to tell the senator how they feel about a particular issue. And another major area would be to ask for help in some way. Let's start with the uh, asking for help. How should a person approach your office if they have a problem, they think it's an appropriate problem, they're not sure whether this is the right place or not, w what can they do? How should they, what steps should they go through? One of the things that they'll often hear too is they can call our office or they can come in or again when we have maybe are in the outlying communities, we'll uh, notify the papers that we will be in that town and they can come in then. Either call or just show up maybe at a county courthouse. Come in and sit down, tell us what problems they might have. We usually call it casework. Okay. And um, it might be a particular problem that may, they may be having with a federal agency or department. And maybe they've made numerous calls, can't um, find the appropriate person, or they're not getting the necessary responses they need, or they're getting a response. It's one they don't like, but, but it is wrong, too, sometimes. Not only that they don't like it, um, they're, or they're get being addressed as the wrong person. It can be many different things. If they have some background information, it's important that they bring that in as well. Um, just so they need to be able to come in and tell us what the problem is, the source, perhaps how long it's been going on, and hopefully they're going to come and tell us before a deadline appears, like yes. tomorrow, <laughs> or today I have to have all this resolved, like with the IRS or someone where often it's hard to reverse those problems. We cannot promise that we, we don't go in and tell the agencies what to do, but we work with them in a cooperative way and try to help resolve these types of problems that occur. And they run the gamut. I mean, they may be a Social Security, uh, they're not getting their check type problem or a disability problem or a veteran or a farmer may be having some sort of problem or someone with the FAA. I mean it could be a variety in, in any department or agency. Often people will come in um, concerned about a state or a local issue 
And while we don't work on those because of the separation, we can often refer them to the appropriate authorities or the correct people that will be able to provide them the assistance they need. So then what kinds of answers can they expect from you? What, uh, I mean, I don't mean exact answers, mm -hmm. but I mean the kinds of things that they can expect generally to hear as responses to their problem. What we will generally do is after we've talked to them, um, we're authorized in behalf of the representative or senator, whichever it may be, to act in their behalf. Um, the constituent, when they come in, we usually, if they've not written a letter, we ask them to sign a form, giving us the, or the senator their permission to act and make an inquiry in their behalf. And we have to do that under the Privacy Act and also Freedom of Information in getting a response to their concerns. What we will usually do then is either by making a phone call or writing a letter, we'll contact that agency and ask them some of the questions that the constituent has relayed to us or their concerns, or at least try to articulate them in what the constituents, identify what that constituent is looking for. And to at least many times is get them an answer. It may not always be a satisfactory answer or the one they wanted, but we're trying to get their concerns addressed. And usually we'll say like, your check, you know, is for so much, it's been cut, or you've been approved for disability, or you need to go here for a physical. We'll work on military concerns where people are trying to get into the military service or trying to get out of the military service or trying to contact someone. Um, we often make, it's, it's so interesting the number of inquiries we get because they're not alike. I'm sure they're all Everyone's different. Everyone's all different. <laughs> and, um, and that's what also adds to the excitement and the learning, is that there's always that one that's truly unique. You've never had anything like it, and, and it's a challenge for us to try to get the type of response that the constituent is looking for, at least to get them that answer. And that's probably more critical than anything. Now, what about if, if you have something you want to tell the senator, a, a, a way that you feel about a particular bill or about an issue? What do you recommend for people in that situation? Should they call? Should they write? Uh, should they write to you? Should they write to the Washington office? How should they go about getting their views to the senator? Well, any of those would be appropriate. Most of the time, if it's in regards to future legislation or the current status of legislation and their concerns or their criticism, it's, it's handled by the Washington office. But they can call us in Coeur d'Alene or any of the local offices, or they can come in and we're glad to take down their comments and we do forward them to the senator as well as some of the legislative staff that work on those issues that it may concern. Like if it's a, an issue about banking concerns or deregulation or whatever it may, may be, we have what we call legislative assistants in Washington who also work on research in behalf of the senator. And we'll, we'll contact them about it as well because then they can keep track. What they do is they track how many people have written in or expressed concerns about that particular area and it kind of occasionally will put up, turn on that red light that there's a great deal of concern out in the state about this topic and maybe there's legislative action that needs to be taken if it hasn't been. Or in this particular way. And having been a person who's written in the past, you usually can expect a reply, right? I would hope so, yes. That's very important to all offices, is that we respond to the constituents. We view it as um, a necessity and an absolute part of our jobs. We're very uh, fortunate in Coeur d'Alene. We're a city of almost 22,000 people, and very few cities that size in the United States could say they had two U.S. senators and one U.S. congressman with offices in that city, with your office for Senator Larry Craig, and then there's the office for Senator uh, Steve uh, Sims, and then Congressman Larry LaRocco, all right here in the city. I, I, as you were talking, I thought about the advantage of that because between those three members of Congress serving on different committees and different yes. areas of expertise, that it creates a wealth of um, opportunities for citizens. If they come to one of your offices, but the other senator or the congressman is more dealing in that area, you can send them over there to with. Uh, I, I assume when you serve on certain committees, then you, you develop more with your staff expertise in that area. So we, my point is that you can just really get a, a real broad-based uh, advice. Uh, in relation to that, I, I was very interested to hear you say that in addition to the congressional offices, we have 
uh, one or two state legislative offices in the city, and I was at one of the state senator's offices some time ago, and a, and a constituent came in, and it was truly a federal problem, and she sent that constituent to your office, and so in the same way, if, if they come in, you can, uh, that in itself is a good clearinghouse, isn't it? Because a lot of times the individual doesn't know who's dealing with the problem. Oh, absolutely. And that happens probably more often than, than people realize. It's that a problem has become so frustrating and they've gone from place to place and they can't gather the information they need or response <coughs> or get anyone to respond to them and they come out of sheer frustration. And they're not always asking us to resolve their problem what they're really looking for is, who do I contact? Direct me to the right sources, mm -hmm. and I'm willing to do this myself. And that's what we find with most constituents. At that point, you become an ombudsman, don't yes. you? Yes, and, and that's exciting, too. Because again, if you, many times we don't even know the appropriate resource, but again, it's, it's there for us to find out and try to assist that constituent. I'm sort of very respectful of privacy, and I'm not asking, of course, to identify any constituent, but to, from the humanistic or, or a human story uh, that, that could be very interesting. Give us an example of something that you have faced over that uh, uh, 10 years uh, come July. You've had a lot of constituents in. What is an example of something that was really challenging and very difficult for you um, among all the kinds of issues that you have to deal with? Well, you what, it, what comes immediately to mind for me were almost two cases and um, what I call casework, I, because I spent a great deal of time in behalf of the senator working with p these people, and he did too, in fact. He was directly involved on these cases. And one thing he asked for us is occasionally, call me and give me one, and I'll personally work it out all myself, and call that constituent and work with them. But one was a gentleman who lives here in Coeur d'Alene, and I had met at a, like a chamber of commerce function and I recognized his face, I didn't know him, and knew that he had been involved in some problems with the federal government. And what he was involved in was designing the uh, Space Center at the Seattle World's Fair in 19, was it 64, two? And what he built it, and the government had commissioned him to, and then they didn't pay him. And for the last 18 years, he had gone to court and he had tried to get them to respond and Senator Jackson from Washington State and Magnuson, they did, tried to assist him and introduce legislation through what they call a uh, private relief bill and just had never gotten all of the support of the Senate that they needed. And so he came up and, and I started talking with him and it was a challenge. It was like, we want to help you, you deserve to be paid. And he'd lost his business. He became a, like a traveling um, clothing salesman. And uh, he'd, he'd sacrificed, I think, a great deal to help the government. And so a number of senators, Congressman Foley, Senator Sims, Senator McClure, at the time were involved. And uh, they contacted their colleagues. And they were successful in getting this man paid after nearly 20 years. And to me, that was a real challenge. It was a delight to see that happen. It was a very, I mean, you do this many times because it makes you feel good too, to see the rewards. That's often the most you get in the form is, is that reward in satisfying the constituent. Another example was uh, another gentleman in, in uh, a rural area whose wife and uh, another daughter had come here from Vietnam and had left one daughter there. She didn't escape with them. And they had been without her for eight years. And there was a period of time where, you know, our country had no relations with Vietnam, and so they were not able to accomplish anything. But writing letters to the United Nations, the ambassador, um, to members of our Senate um, were exciting. We translated letters and tried to do as many different and creative type things as we could and she was able to come here finally. And this was three or four years we worked on it and uh, go to public schools here in North Idaho. And to, uh, to me, and I know Senator Craig too, that was personally very rewarding to see the unification of that family. Your work has just got multiplicity of facets to it. Uh, I know another thing that you've done, you've been very cooperative with, with some things I've been involved in. Uh, it, it's an exciting job you have, but you have uh, represented the senator 
at some special ceremonies and functions and delivered messages from him. So that's a, another function that your office performs also, isn't it? Yes, it, you sort of become, um, I would say, a generalist, a jack of all trades. And um, I can't think of any direct job dis or specific job description that comes to mind. It, it's whatever needs to be done, usually you respond to. There are other services, too, I guess that I'd like to talk about Please. in coming to any of the congressional offices, be it here or anywhere in the Northwest. And that is, people often would like maybe a flag, a U.S. flag. And um, we can have them flown or request in your behalf over, flown over the U.S. Capitol for a very, what I would call, minor fee, usually for seven, maybe eight dollars, or depending on the size of the flag. But you get receive a certified um, certificate that kind of tells you, well, that not kind of, it tells you what day the flag was flown. And um, it's rewarding. I know that I've seen them given as gifts, and that's one of the unique services. We receive a number of requests. We also arrange uh, tours in Washington, D.C. for people in federal buildings like the U.S. Capitol, the White House, um, the FBI is a popular one, Bureau of Printing and Engraving where they're printing money. That's exciting to people. And also other information we try to provide. Some of the others are um, nominations to U.S. military academies. All of the congressional offices are involved in that. and. I'm trying to think of all the variety of things. Help with passports or immigration, assistance for government publications, and we just try to provide a variety of services that many people don't always know that are really there. One, one thing I want to do before we're out of time, I, after this, uh, we put up a number on the screen, I'm sure they'll put it up. I, I would like for you to give uh, our viewers both the address where you can be located here in Coeur d'Alene and then also a telephone number. Uh, individuals may want to call, even they might want to call from other counties that, that, that can't come in uh, very often. So if you'd give us that information. The phone number in the Coeur d'Alene office is 667-6130. If we could go back and get that again and get the area code too for someone All that right. might call out of state. The area code here is 208-667-6130. And the address, it, it's in downtown Coeur d'Alene, is 103 North 4th Street. And it's just, just uh, on the intersection of 4th and Sherman in Coeur d'Alene. If you're in an outlying area and are interested in meeting us when we're in your area, call. And we'll try and arrange an appointment with you the next time we're in some of the outlying counties. Or even if there's a group that wants to have a meeting, if they would call you, then you could arrange a meeting to be somewhere with a, 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 a large number of people if they need to be. Yes, and not always with me, too. That yes. is another thing. One of the unique things about Idaho is that anyone can have an appointment. Yes, and I, I'm so sorry to interrupt. We're out of time. I wish we had more time. Sandy Patano, thank you very, very much. You've been most informative and cooperative. And again, many thanks. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us again next week at this same time when we will discuss again what we believe to be an important issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of Telemedia Services on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.